بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله نحمده تعالى ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلله فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أما بعد So continuing with where we left off from our study of the 40 ahadith of Imam al-Nawwi currently we at hadith number 35 and we reached the part where the messenger alayhi salatu wasalam he said وَكُونُوا عِبَادَ اللَّهِ إِخْوَانًا And be slaves of Allah as brothers. المسلم أخو المسلم The Muslim is the brother of another Muslim. لا يظلمه ولا يخذله ولا يكذبه ولا يحقره He doesn't oppress him. He doesn't betray him he doesn't lie to him and he doesn't look down upon him At-taqwa ha huna taqwa is here wa yushiru ila sadrihi thalatha marrat and the messenger pointed to his chest three times bi hasb imra'in min ash-sharr an yahqir akhahu al-muslim it is enough of an evil for a person that he looks down, that he mocks his Muslim brother. كل المسلم على المسلم حرام دمه وماله وعرضه All of the Muslim upon the Muslim is haram, his blood, his wealth and his honor. So concerning this, and this is essentially where Sheikh Abdul Muhsin Abad's second part to the explanation begins, because we said that the explanation is divided into four parts. So we've covered the first part. As for the second part, then in this, the Messenger alayhi salatu wasalam, he prohibited us from several things, because these are things that negate the rights of a Muslim. From them, is that it's prohibited us to transgress against the Muslim, harming him, whether it's physically or otherwise. The second matter that the Messenger alayhi salatu wasalam prohibited is betraying the Muslim. How do you betray him? The one that is betraying the Muslim, Shaykh Abdul Muhsin, he said, وَلَا يَخْذُلُهُ عِنْدَ حَاجَتِهِ إِلَىٰ نُصْرَتِهِ وَهُوَ قَادِرٌ عَلَىٰ أَنْ يَنْصُرَهُ The person betrays his Muslim brother when he doesn't help him whenever that Muslim needs his help and you're able to help him. The Muslim, he's in a situation where he needs your help. He needs your assistance. You're able to help him. You're able to assist him. It's within your ability. It's not going to harm you. It's not going to cost you anything. Yet in spite of that, you abandon him, you don't aid him, you don't help him, you don't assist him. This is khadran. This is betrayal. وَلَا يَكْذِبُهُ And he doesn't lie to him. He doesn't lie to his Muslim brother. He doesn't inform him with speech that is untrue. وَلَا يَحْقِرُهُ And he doesn't make ihtiqar of him. He doesn't look down upon him. He doesn't mock him. And, and then the Messenger, alayhi salatu wasalam, he highlighted to us how vile it is for a person to make ihtiqar of his Muslim brother. The Messenger, alayhi salatu wasalam, he said, بِحَسْبِ مْرِئٍ مِنَ الشَّرْ أَنْ يَحْقِرَ أَخَاهُ الْمُسْلِمِ it is enough of an evil of a person that he looks down upon his Muslim brother. 
that is enough of an evil of a person that he merely looks down upon his Muslim brother. If it is the case that a person is characterized with all forms of good, there is no negative quality found in him. Everything about him is good, virtuous, righteous. However, there is one characteristic that is vile, one characteristic that is wrong, incorrect, the characteristic of looking down upon his Muslim brother, and that is enough to say that he is an evil person. That is enough for him, for him to be considered an evil person, just by him looking down upon his Muslim brother. Whether it's looking down upon him because of his race, his ethnic background, because at the end of the day, all of us, our origin is the same. Our origin is one. As Allah Jalla wa Ala, He said, Alam nakhluk, alam alam min ma'in Did we not create him from despised fluid? All of us, we come from that despised fluid. And therefore, how can we look down upon each other just because of one coming from one ethnic, ba ethnic background and the other coming from another? Is it the case that a person looks down upon someone because of his knowledge, <coughs> because of his understanding, because of his, his reason, his intellect? And then Allah Jalla wa Ala, He has said, Wa fawqa. There is above every single possessor of knowledge someone else that has more knowledge. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, regardless of how much knowledge you may have, regardless of how much understanding you may have, regardless of how intelligent you may be, there is someone that is much more knowledgeable than you. Therefore humble yourself. Regardless of whatever a person may have, strength that he may have, physical strength, he looks down upon others because so-and-so is such a weakling. Look at him. So he looks down upon other people because of his physical strength, yet even a camel he is more stronger than you. Therefore, regardless of a reason, regardless of the cause behind a Muslim looking down upon his other Muslim, there is no basis for it. There is no foundation for it and that is enough of an evil for that person that he looks down upon his Muslim brother and the messenger alayhi salatu was salam if you notice Sheikh Abdul Muhsin al-Abad he is indicating to something that the messenger alayhi salatu was salam prohibits us from mocking and looking down upon the Muslim brother and then the Messenger alayhi salatu wasalam, highlights how despicable and vile and repugnant and ugly a sin and evil a sin it is to look down upon your Muslim brother. But then between the two, between the prohibition and between the highlighting of its evil, evilness, the Messenger alayhi salatu wasalam, says something in between. What does he say? He said, "At-taqwa ha huna wa yushiru ila sadrihi thalatha marrat." He said, "Piety is here," and he pointed to his chest three times. <coughs> Meaning, the thing that carries weight, the thing that has actual value, is piety. His taqwa. Fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that taqwa, its location, is in the heart. And thus perhaps, the one that you look down upon, the one that you mock, the one that you consider to be insignificant, perhaps, that person 
has a heart that is filled with taqwa. And perhaps the one who is mocking, the one who is looking down, perhaps his heart is in contrast to that. His heart is the opposite of that. He is a person that is filled with sins and transgression. The thing that bears weight, the thing that is given consideration, it is the heart. Because that is the location of taqwa. And if it is the case that taqwa is in the heart, then no doubt it will manifest itself upon the tongue and upon the limbs. And therefore, Sheikh Abdul Muhsin al-Abbad, as an extension to this point, he says that this statement, the following statement that you may find many people making, whenever they err, whenever they commit a sin, whenever they commit a mistake, that statement that you find people making, when you say to them, don't sin, this sin that you're doing, Allah Jalla wa ala is not pleased with it. When you reprimand someone from sinning, and you find some people pointing to their chest and saying, At-taqwa ha-huna. They'll say, taqwa is here, my brother. Piety, it's in my chest. Righteousness, it's in my heart. And they are quoting a narration, a statement from the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. But that is kalamul haq urida bihi al-batil. A statement of truth, no doubt. However, falsehood is intended by way of it. <coughs> because if taqwa was actually in a person's heart, and taqwa was at that level, then it would end up translating into physical manifestations, manifestations upon the tongue, manifestations upon the limb. If piety is in a person's heart, you're going to see some degree of effect of that taqwa taking place on the person's tongue. If piety and righteousness is in a person's heart, then you're going to find some type of physical manifestation of that taqwa on a person's limbs. And thus the Messenger alayhi salatu wasalam, we find him saying in that narration that we had studied a while back, أَلَا إِنَّ فِي الْجَسَدِ مُضْغَى إِذَا صَلُحَتْ صَلُحَ الْجَسَدُ كُلُّهُ وَإِذَا فَسَدَتْ فَسَدَ الْجَسَدُ كُلُّهُ أَلَا وَهِيَ الْقَلْبِ <coughs> that indeed, in the body, there is a morsel of flesh. If it is sound, then the whole body is sound. And if it is corrupt, then the whole body is corrupt. And the, and the, and the Messenger, alayhi salatu wasalam, he likewise said, إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَنْظُرُ إِلَىٰ سُوَرِكُمْ وَأَمْوَالِكُمْ وَلَكِنْ يَنْظُرْ إِلَىٰ قُلُوبِكُمْ وَأَعْمَالِكُمْ Indeed Allah does not look at your physical appearances and neither at your wealth but He looks at your hearts and your deeds. The narration recorded by Imam Muslim in his Sahih and it has been reported from the Salaf that they said لَيْسَ الْإِيمَانِ بِالتَّمَنِّ وَلَا بِالتَّحَلِّ Iman isn't mere wishing, just wishing that you had Iman. And neither is it merely adorning yourself with external iman, with externally adorning yourself with righteous deeds, just externally. وَلَكِنْ مَا وَقَرَ فِي الْقَلْبِ وَصَدَّقَتْهُ الْأَعْمَالِ But rather iman, it is what settles in the hearts and then the actions, they attest to it. <coughs> Therefore, this clearly indicates that it is not enough for us to say, piety is in my heart, iman is in my heart, faith is in my heart, righteousness is in my heart. And that's enough. And I can behave as I want to behave. I can act as and, as and how I please. It doesn't matter if I, if I do good deeds or, or not. No, that's incorrect. Because if Iman has truly gone into your heart, 
if taqwa has truly taken residency in your heart, then it will inevitably become manifest in your actions. Your actions will be a testimony to the taqwa that's in your heart. That is the end of part number two to Sheikh Abdul Muhsin's explanation. Part number three. <coughs> Part number three is concerning the statement of our Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam كُلُّ الْمُسْلِمِ عَلَى الْمُسْلِمِ حَرَامٌ دَمُهُ وَمَالُهُ وَعِرْضُهُ All of the Muslim upon the Muslim is haram His wealth, his, sorry, his, well, his blood, his wealth and his honor And thus them here, the Messenger Alayhi Salatu Wasalam He is highlighting to us How Sacred these three matters are of the Muslim that his blood it is haram for you to take either by killing or by that which is less than that physically harming him, fighting him likewise transgressing against the Muslim as far as his wealth is concerned that is haram, either by stealing or by extortion or otherwise. And likewise, the honor of the Muslim is haram for you to violate, either by insulting him or cursing him or backbiting him or tail carrying concerning him or anything besides that. And the Messenger of Allah, alayhi salatu was salam, he has emphasized this matter. He has emphasized how sacred these three things are. The blood of a Muslim, the wealth of a Muslim, the honor of a Muslim. He emphasized this matter in his farewell pilgrimage. And he compared them. He compared the hurma of the Muslim the sanctity of the blood of the Muslim and the wealth of the Muslim and the honor of the Muslim, he compared it to the sanctity and the sacredness of the time and the place that he was in and at, at the farewell pilgrimage. He was at the plains of Arafat on the day of Arafah in the month of the Hijjah, sacred place, Sacred time. And the Messenger alayhi salatu wasalam, he said, Inna dima'akum wa amwalakum wa a'radakum alaykum haram ka hurmati yawmikum hadha fi shahrikum hadha fi baladikum hadha. Indeed, your wealth, indeed your blood, and your wealth, and your honor is haram upon you. Haram for others to take. Haram for you to take these things and transgress against others concerning these things. It is haram just like the hurma of this day, just like the sanctity of this day, the sacredness of this day, in the sanctity and the sacredness of this month of yours, in this land of yours, in this place of yours. Yani. So this clearly indicates how sanctified the Muslims blood and the Muslims wealth and the Muslims honor even is to such an extent that it was compared to Yom Arafah on the day of Arafah that there is a is the end of Sheikh Abdul Muhsin's third part to his explanation now is the fourth part and the fourth part as usual is a summary of the benefits and the points of benefit that the Shaykh summarizes are ten. So the first point is تحريم التحاسد والتناجش والبيع على بيع أخيه وكذا الشراء على شرائه وكذا كل ما يجلب العداوة والبغضاء بين المسلمين. The fifth, the first point is the prohibition of having حسد. Envy between each other. And the prohibition of a tanajush. The prohibition of artificially inflating the prices. 
and the prohibition of entering upon the transaction of your Muslim brother or entering upon the purchase of your Muslim brother and likewise the prohibition of everything that can bring about hatred between the Muslimin. Bar number two. In this hadith there is a prohibition concerning pursuing the doorways to hatred. Those things that will lead to us hating each other and thus boycotting each other. Number three. In this hadith, there is an encouragement for the Muslims, all of them, to be like brothers, like brothers, loving one another, being in harmony together. Number four, that the Islamic Brotherhood demands, requires from us, that we impart good towards each other and that we repel harm from each other. Number five, that it is prohibited for the Muslim to oppress his brother, to forsake his brother, to abandon and forsake and betray his brother, to betray his brother and to mock and look down upon his brother and to lie upon his brother again number five it is prohibited for the Muslim to oppress his brother to betray his brother to look down upon his brother and to lie upon his brother number six in this hadith there is a clarification about the danger, the danger of looking down upon your Muslim brother. And that looking down upon him is enough of an evil of, from you. Even if there's no other evil in you, that's enough. If you want to know whether you're an evil person, you pray to Hajjud, you give Sadaqah, you have so many other supererogatory deeds yet you look down upon your Muslim brothers and sisters then know that you are a person that has evil inside of him you're an evil person even if you have nothing but khair about you nothing but goodness about you but you look down upon your Muslim brother that is enough of an evil of you number seven أن الميزان في التفاضل بين الناس التقوى. Number seven is that the standard via which people's superiority is determined is taqwa. The way that it is determined in the eyes of Allah whether this person is better. Or that person is better, this person is superior, or that person is superior, the standard that is used in order to determine that is taqwa, is piety. As Allah Jalla wa ala here said, In akramakum indallahi atqakum. Indeed, the most honorable of you in the eyes of Allah is the one that has the most taqwa. Number eight. At-taqwa mahalluha al-qalb. Taqwa, its location is in the heart. As Allah Jalla wa ala has said, ذَلِكَ وَمَنْ يُعَذِّمْ شَعَائِرَ اللَّهِ فَإِنَّهَا مِنْ تَقْوَى الْقُلُوبِ Whoever honors the rituals of Allah, then that is from the taqwa of the heart. Number nine. أن التقوى في القلوب تظهر آثارها على الجوارح وبصلاح القلوب يصلح بقية الجسد that the taqwa that is in the heart its effects become manifest upon the limbs 
and by the rectification of one's heart does the rest of the body become also rectified. And finally, point number 10. تحريم الاعتداء على المسلمين في دمائهم وأموالهم وأعراضهم The prohibition of transgressing against the Muslims in their wealth, in their blood, sorry, in their wealth and in their honor. So that is a, that is the completion of our study of hadith number 35. Next we'll move on to hadith number 36 and we'll cover whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows us to cover in this remaining time that we have. It is the hadith of Abi Hurairah radiallahu ta'ala an. An in Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam aqal. Man nafasa an mu'minin kurbatan min kurabid, min kurabid dunya. نفس الله عنه كربة من كرب يوم القيامة. Whoever relieves a believer from suffering, whoever relieves a believer from the sufferings of the dunya, then Allah shall relieve him from the sufferings of يوم القيامة. ومن يسر على معسر يسر الله عليه في الدنيا والآخرة. and whoever makes easy for the person that is in straitened circumstances, a person that is in debt, whoever makes easy for someone that is in straitened circumstances, then Allah shall make easy for him his his affairs in this life and in the afterlife. ومن ستر مسلما ستره الله في الدنيا والآخرة and whoever conceals a Muslim then Allah shall conceal him in the dunya and the akhirah the afterlife والله في عون العبد ما كان العبد في عون أخيه and Allah is in the aid of his brother and Allah is in the aid of his slave rather as long as the slave is in the aid of his brother وَمَنْ سَلَكَ طَرِيقًا يَلْتَمِسُ فِيهِ عِلْمًا سَهَّلَ اللَّهُ لَهُ بِهِ طَرِيقًا إِلَى الْجَنَّةِ And whoever traverses a path seeking in it knowledge, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shall make easy for him by way of that his path to paradise, a path to paradise. وَمَا اجْتَمَعَ قَوْمٌ فِي بَيْتٍ مِنْ بُيُوتِ اللَّهِ يتلون كتاب الله ويتدارسونه بينهم إلا نزلت عليهم السكينة وغشيتهم الرحمة وحفتهم الملائكة وذكرهم الله في من عنده And no group of people gather together in a house from the houses of Allah reciting the book of Allah studying it between themselves except that the angel and except that tranquility descends down upon them mercy covers them the angels surround them and allah ends up mentioning them with those that are with him woman لم يسرع به نسبه. And whoever's actions have caused him to slow down, then his lineage is not going to hasten him. His lineage is not going to make him go quicker. The hadith being recorded by Imam Muslim. <coughs> Shaykh Abdul Muhsin al-Abbad's explanation to this hadith has been divided into eight parts. The eighth and final part being a summary of the benefits. So as for the first part, then it is concerning the statement of the Messenger alayhi salatu wasalam when he said, Whoever relieves a believer 
from a suffering, from the sufferings of the dunya, then Allah shall relieve him from the from the then Allah shall relieve him from the sufferings of Yawm al Qiyamah. This here is in reality the principle known as Al Jaza bi Jins al Amal. That the recompense and the reward is based upon the type of action. You reward someone with something based upon the action that they did. Or as they say, what goes around comes around. So because it is the case that you lifted a suffering from someone else, then as a recompense to that, as a reward to that, Allah will also lift a suffering from you. So that is how they are similar, that they both come from the same jinns. They both come from the same sort, the same type, the same genus. This here is a lifting of suffering that is occurring on your behalf for another Muslim. And then that which Allah does is also a removing of a suffering, a lifting of a suffering. However, the difference likewise that exists between the two is great. Because a person lifting, removing a suffering from someone else in this life, it is something that is azim, it is something that is no doubt great and lofty. However, the suffering, regardless of what we have and what we go through in this life, is nothing in comparison to the sufferings of the day of standing, the sufferings of the day of Al Qiyamah. As the disbelievers shall say, as Allah Jalla wa Allah has said in His book, وَقَالَ الْكَافِرُونَ هَذَا يَوْمٌ عَسِرٌ The disbelievers shall say, This is a day that is Asir. This is a day that is, that is difficult. Allah has described that day in His book when He said, وَيَوْمَ, يف... يوم يَفِرُّ الْمَرْءُ مِنْ أَخِيهِ وَأُمِّهِ وَأَبِيهِ وَصَاحِبَتِهِ وَبَنِيهِ لِكُلِّ امْرِئٍ مِّنْهُمْ يَوْمَئِذٍ شَأْنٌ يُغْنِيهِ On that day a person is going to run away from his mother, from his father, from his wife, his brother, his family, all of them. Why? Because every single person will have an affair that an affair that he'll be preoccupied with. On that day everybody will not be bothered about anyone except himself. Why? Because of how Asir, how difficult that day is gonna be, because of how much suffering there's gonna be on that day, because of how much mutual blaming there's gonna be upon there's gonna be a on that day, because of how much loneliness and solitude people will feel on that day, solitude in that he'll find no one as a helper and a protector for him on that day. So no doubt it's a day that is a day of suffering, suffering for the disbeliever, suffering for the evildoer, for the one that is rebellious against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But as for the believer, as for the righteous person, then for him it shall be a day, a day of ease. May Allah the Most High make it a day of ease for myself and for my family and for yourselves and your families. It shall be a day of ease for the believer. And from the things that shall be a cause of that day being easy for you, is by you removing difficulty, suffering from others. Right now you have a fantastic opportunity to remove suffering from others. No doubt because of the lockdown that most of the countries are either in or are pending to go in, 
in this current situation of ours of the coronavirus sp <coughs> spreading, then you are going to find no doubt people that are suffering, people who, especially the elderly, who are going to find it difficult to go out because of the risk of them being affected and catching the virus, or they may need help in certain affairs like shopping, purchasing food for them, they may need the bill paying for them, they usually go to the post office for example to have the bill paid for them, not all elders are up to date with technology and how to pay things online or how to pay things from their phones, so they need the utility bills paying, they need help in that. Right now you can help these people, because they're going through perhaps unprecedented difficulty and suffering. Help them, aid them, and assist them, and perhaps as a result of which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will help you and assist you and remove difficulty from you in the akhirah, in the afterlife, on the day of standing. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He aids us in attaining beneficial knowledge and righteous actions, that He makes our statements and our actions, or rather our actions coincide with our statements, that He makes the Book of Allah proof for us and not against us. <coughs> and we ask Him the Most High that He removes any suffering from us and He saves us from any suffering on that great day, on that day, that day of standing. إنه ولي ذلك والقادر عليه وصلى الله على نبينا محمد والحمد لله رب العالمين